Why do we use bottle caps as money in Fallout 4? If you're a fan of Fallout, and to be honest, I'd be really surprised if you were here and you weren't, you've probably seen the video by Game Theory where Matt Pat figures out exactly how much a bottle cap would be worth in today's dollars. It's a really, really cool episode if you haven't seen it, so you should definitely check it out when you get the chance. But that's not what I'm asking about today. It's cool, sure, but it's not really relevant to the world of Fallout. A bottle cap is worth whatever a bottle cap is worth in the Fallout universe, regardless of the price of gold of the United States in 2016. But I'm not here to present a counter case to MatPat. Instead, I'm wondering something, almost purely from a lore perspective. Does it make sense at all that bottle caps are used in the East Coast settings of Fallout? To understand why I'm even asking this question, we have to know the lore of bottle caps. Uh, bottle caps were first introduced in Fallout 1 as the game's main currency. In Fallout 1, it was the currency of the hub. Bottle caps were a form of what's called representative money. That, that's to say that one unit of currency, in this case one bottle cap, represents a claim on a commodity. An example of this in our real world is the gold standard, where paper money represented a claim on a certain amount of real life gold. In fact, for a while, until the gold standard was mercifully abandoned for the betterment of everyone, you could take a $1 bill in the United States and trade it in for an equal amount of gold. Anyway. Bottle caps didn't represent gold. Instead, they were actually backed by water. Originally, merchants in the hub would trade using water, but started using caps instead because, you know, it's easier to hand someone 10 bottle caps than it is to carry jugs of water around with you everywhere. You know, this mirrors a lot of the real history surrounding currencies pretty well, honestly. In the ancient Fertile Crescent, the currency was the shekel, which represented a bushel of barley. Shekels were rarely used in everyday transactions, of course, but they were used as the predominant measurement of value. Which brings us to exactly why currency even exists to begin with. Currency is meant to function as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. So, when I I want your stim pack and you're willing to sell it, I give you 48 bottle caps and you give me the stim pack. That's the exchange. Of course, it's totally common in the wasteland to trade stuff for stuff, but the value of what's being traded is still measured in caps. Like, if I want that stim pack but I don't have caps but I'm loaded down with garbage, I still have to give you 48 caps worth of junk. These two ideas, the uh, giving you caps or giving you a certain number of caps worth of something for another thing, both illustrate the principles of medium of exchange and unit of account, because caps are the actual thing we use to trade. And if that's not an option, it's still the method of accounting for the value of objects. Now, if I hand you those caps, in order for the currency to be good, they have to be mostly worth the same thing tomorrow as they are today, and the next week, and months from now. They can change a little bit though, but the less stable a currency is, the less reliable it is as a medium of exchange. This is the store of value part. It's probably something we think the least about in a day-to-day -day way, but but it's honestly one of the most important qualifiers for a currency. Out of control inflation makes money almost more trouble than it's worth, and out of control deflation can be a thousand times more terrifying. And as being a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value, bottle caps honestly work really, really well. They were chosen from a lore perspective because the technology for creating bottle caps was lost when the bombs dropped, meaning that the number of bottle caps in circulation rarely changes. New caps enter the economy only very rarely when folks find a stash somewhere or someone opens a bottle of cola to drink its contents. It's very, very similar to gold in this way, which was the standard currency for thousands of years. Inflation basically couldn't exist, at least not aggressive inflation, because in order for there to be more money, more gold had to be found. Gold is relatively rare, like bottle caps, so it very infrequently entered the economy at a rate that humans couldn't handle. To those of us who kind of grow up thinking of gold as being innately valuable, it makes the idea of bottle caps being the exact same thing as the gold standard kind of ludicrous. But why is gold valuable? I mean, you can't eat it. You can't really make any reliable tools from it. Unless you're very, very wealthy and very, very strong, you can't build a house from it. You can make jewelry, of course, but that just means it's pretty. It doesn't have very many utilities, especially in an era without modern electronics manufacturing. So practically speaking, there's nothing that makes gold any more valuable to us than paper or bottle caps. So it's true that gold doesn't have a lot of practical utility to an animal when it comes to directly facilitating survival, but gold is very, very good at being one thing. Money. To understand why, we're gonna have to look at what gold is a bit more closely. When are you gonna talk about how it makes no sense that there are bottle caps in the East Coast games like Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 when bottle caps were a currency established in the West Coast of Fallout 1 and 2? Calm, calm down, we'll, we'll get there. Just 
Trust me. Anyway, back to gold. Sanat Kumar is the department chair of chemical engineering at Columbia University in New York, and he went through all the different elements on the periodic table one by one and explained why they, unlike gold, are really, really bad at being money. Gases, for instance, are the... Uh, well, gases, and are hard to see, weigh, and store. In fact, some, like helium, eventually leak out of even the most well-sealed containers, so gases are no good. Other heavier elements, like lithium, are incredibly reactive and prone to bursting into flames without warning, and even if they're not that reactive, they're still unstable enough that they eventually corrode away, like silver. Others, like silicon, are incredibly common to the point of being essentially worthless. Some, like these down here, are radioactive, while rare metals like osmium are so rare that, you know, you basically can't find them. Anyway, when he cut through all the crap, there are two metals on our planet that were the most likely candidates for being used as money, gold and platinum. Both are rare and therefore inflation resistant, but not so rare as to be unfindable. And they're shelf stable, meaning that they don't corrode away like silver and other metals. So why did gold end up winning out in the test of history? Well, for two reasons. One. Gold is very easy to identify over other objects, whereas platinum kind of looks a lot like other metals. But more importantly, gold has a melting temperature of only 1064 degrees Celsius or 1948 degrees Fahrenheit, which is easily meltable by a regular fire. Whereas platinum has to be heated over 1700 degrees Celsius or over 3000 degrees Fahrenheit in order to be turned into distinct and standardized coins. So with gold, we can add easy to identify and easy to turn into money. So what does this have to do with bottle caps? Well, quite a lot actually. Bottle caps have a lot of these same qualities themselves. They're rare, but not too rare. They seem to be mostly shelf stable since they've managed to stick around relatively unaltered for over 200 years, are inflation resistant like gold is because the technology to create them has been lost. They're easy to identify and really, really hard to forge. So all the qualities that make gold good at being money, bottle caps, have in spades. This is cool and all, but from a lore perspective, does it make any sense that they're using bottle caps in the wasteland of the DC area, like in Fallout 3 or in the Commonwealth in Fallout 4? Bethesda never really answers this directly. So after going through all these different qualities that make gold a good ancient currency, Kumar even posited that if we were to reset the world all over again, back to zero and try it again, humans would very likely choose gold as a currency again, no matter what, because of these qualities that make it so clearly favorable over the other options. So it stands to reason that in different pockets of the United States wasteland, folk would choose to rely on bottle caps because of their unique qualities as a good currency. But this isn't good enough for me, and it relies on way too much randomness and coincidence. But it lets me talk about my absolute favorite thing ever, the Jet Road. You know, it's funny, when I was in school growing up, my history teachers framed the world as though countries and nation states were just these isolated pockets of their own culture for thousands of years until the age of industry, when suddenly we discovered better boats and airplanes that could finally, finally conduct trade across the world with people far away from us. But this wasn't really the case at all. The Silk Road, for instance, existed for thousands of years. It was a interconnected trade network that stretched from China all the way to Europe. Everything from food to spices were traded, but the biggest export was its namesake, silk. The Silk Road was also responsible for bringing the very first shipment of opium to China. Opium was one of the only things Western powers could leverage over China to maintain anything resembling an economic edge for hundreds of years. And it was even the catalyst of a couple of wars. Drugs are always, always popular in trade, which brings us back to the Jet Road. You see, bottle caps aren't the only things from the West Coast we see in the East. Jet, for instance, was invented by Myron in Fallout 2 and was immensely popular. So seeing it in Fallout 3 and 4, even though they take place a mere 40 years after the events of Fallout 2 on the opposite end of the country, that seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Well, no, not really. The Silk Road, for instance, existed in ages before cars, antibiotics, and airplanes and span thousands of miles in all directions. Walking from San Francisco to Washington DC takes only 38 days of travel. Obviously you need to stop and rest, but it's feasible that it would take less than a year for goods to be traded one way and then back again. There's 
plenty of evidence that people travel from east to west all the time. There's the paramilitary organizations with lots of resources, of course, like the Enclave and the Brotherhood of Steel, but Harold, a character from Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, makes an appearance in Fallout 3. And in a memory sequence, you learn that Kellogg, the very first antagonist of Fallout 4, originally grew up in the NCR and worked his way east to find his fortune. So it stands to reason that the East Coast, West Coast, and everything in between have a thriving trade relationship with one another, with goods traveling up and down this jet road, even though they're in their own somewhat isolated communities. And if they're trading with one another, it makes sense that they'd use an agreed upon currency, even if it's something as silly as bottle caps. So do bottle caps make sense as a currency? Well, they're rare, but not too rare. They're easy to carry. They're hard to fake. They're inflation resistant. And why are they out east? because of global trade and the sweet, sweet allure of drugs that people will never be rid of because drugs, drugs never changes. D change. Yeah. Thanks for watching. So in case you haven't realized it yet, I'm a little bit of an economics nerd. Actually, a little bit more than a little bit of an economics nerd. I actually have a collection of John Maynard Keynes's essays right here on my desk. I'm also a huge, huge listener of the Planet Money and Freakonomics podcasts, both of which talk about real economics in an everyday way that makes it easy for, you know, you and I to understand. I'm a huge audio guy and I get really, really bored by reading. You know, it's funny because I love the stuff that's in books. I just hate sitting and reading them. I'm the kind of person who likes to move and accomplish things and reading just often feels like a waste of my time. It's why I love podcasts so much. And it's also why I fucking love audiobooks from Audible. I know sponsorships kind of make you feel bleh, but I actually really like Audible because it lets me learn stuff while I'm like, vacuuming my apartment. In fact, I've researched rethinking episodes while doing the dishes. Like Ray Kurzweil's book, How to Create a Mind, for the episode on synths. Um, right now I'm listening to Misbehaving by economist Richard Thaler. Thaler is a pioneer in a branch of economics called behavioral economics, which is a reaction to traditional economics that tends to presume that people within an economic system, like you and me, are these preternatural, logical, rational people, like a bunch of Mr. Spocks, whereas behavioral economics is an attempt to incorporate things like predictive psychology and sociology to solve big economic problems like, like poverty and self-control and what is fair. And if you use the link in our description, you get a 30-day free trial and you get to pick one book for free out of their 150,000 books that they have, which seems pretty sweet to me. You can listen to a book I've listened to, like How to Create a Mind or Misbehaving or Choose Something Else. It doesn't matter. You can either click the link in the description or head over to audible.com slash shoddy and, you know, get smarter while you do the dishes or something. So what do you think? Am I overthinking the reasons behind bottle caps being the currency and the East Coast renditions of Fallout? Is it just Bethesda being like, yeah, this is part of the Fallout aesthetic. Let's just throw it in there. But I mean, I don't know. The whole jet road thing. I like the, the whole trade thing. It makes a lot of sense to me. Anyway, all the stuff about money in the episode is legit research and uh, really true things. You should check out the Planet Money podcast, which I have uh, that talks about all the different elements. I have that linked in the description. Thank you to our Patreon supporters who have donated their actual money every month to keep ShoddyCast alive. It's because of that that we are able to keep this show running. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Watch our other videos. We got some of those. And um, tell me what you think. Should we go back to a bottle cap standard? <laughs> when will the great bottle cap bubble come and burst and create a, a deflation spiral in the Fallout universe? I actually had a joke about that and John Maynard Keynes's child or ancestor or future ancestor coming, but nothing happened. I was gonna talk about bitcoins too, but the episode's already long enough. Cryptocurrency! Yeah.